Now we know that from last week that Jesus was first of all hauled in front of the Jewish courts because that was a, this was a legal matter for them and their legal uh, Jewish rules and laws. And then after that, uh, he was taken to the Roman side. And that comes later. Last week we saw that he was taken uh, first to uh, Annas, high priest. And this morning we'll see that he is taken to Caiaphas, the current high priest. And as we said, the high priest, even though it was a Jewish office, it was a political appointment by the Romans. Now, as we read in, in just, a, just a moment here, there's going to be a reference to this Sanhedrin court. And we probably heard that term, and it was just their sort of religious supreme court for, for their uh, Jewish way of life at that time. There were about 70 members. They were called the elders of the people. And yet, uh, they were supposed to be the, you know, prim and proper, uh, well-respected leaders of the Jewish faith to be appointed to this Sanhedrin council. And as we read, we won't catch it all at one time, but, but they broke every rule they had in this trial of Jesus. They broke every, every rule that they had, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. <clears throat> so let's uh, look at this. Uh, verse 57 of Matthew 26. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. And they spit in his face, struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah. We see this situation here before Sanhedrin court. And these people had used Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. And so that gives you an idea of how corrupt they were. If they'll do that, they'll do anything. This was a mockery of a, of a trial. I guess our, our word would be a kangaroo court. They uh, had false witnesses come to testify against Jesus. Now it had to be a pretty serious charge because they were looking for evidence to put him to death. They had to find something in their law that Jesus had violated that was capital offense, meaning worthy of the death penalty. Many false witnesses came forward, but they couldn't quite come up with anything that was of a capital offense. Now, we all remember the Ten Commandments. And 
one of the Ten Commandments says, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. <coughs> that is, you do not lie, especially in a court of law, against your fellow man. That's just as plain as day. That is just as plain as day as thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not commit adultery. But here were these great Jewish leaders that were great sons of Abraham that violated one of the Ten Commandments right here by bringing up false witnesses. So that tells you where, where it was going. Finally, two people came up and said, well, we heard him say that he could tear down the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. <clears throat> did he say that? Yes, he did. And you know, he was referring to his body and after three days he would be resurrected and rebuilt. <clears throat> they didn't understand that, didn't want to. And so the high priest says, okay, you heard the charge, uh, Jesus, uh, aren't you going to go to bat for yourself and answer? He just sat silent. And again, we say, why didn't he defend himself? And the answer is, all of this monkey business was inconsequential on the path to the cross tomorrow. All that happened, good or bad, true or false, was unimportant because Jesus was on the way to the cross. And that's why he didn't answer didn't need to. Finally, the high priest said, under oath, I charge you, point blank, tell me, are you the Messiah? And Jesus says, well, you've, you've said so. And then he says, but from now on, you're going to see me at, the, see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And that was a quotation from the Old Testament that referred to the Messiah. Jesus says, basically, I am the Messiah. It was a dead ringer. It was, this was their, their phrase, their concept of what the Messiah would be. At the right hand of God, coming in the clouds of glory. That was Messiah. And Jesus says, I'm He. Therefore, that's why the Jews then said, this is blasphemy. He's equating himself with the Son of God, it's blasphemy. We need to put him to death. What more do we need? It's a done deal. It's over. Let's kill him. And then they begin to abuse him, and make fun of him, spit on him. Things that we just can't imagine doing. That's what they did. And mocked him. Say, you know, who hit you? Tell us. And all like that. We see this. This Jewish Sanhedrin council, first of all, wasn't supposed to meet at night. And number two, they were supposed to have at least 23 members before they had any kind of a decision about life and death. It was just a minor thing. They could have less than 23 in attendance. Don't know how many were here. But if you think about it, here it is at, at nighttime and, and uh, probably late nighttime. And uh, this uh, rough crowd had gone out and captured Jesus and brought him in. Do you think there were 23 Sanhedrin members here? Probably not. They didn't care. They weren't supposed to be meeting, but anyway, they did anyway. And so it was a mockery of a trial uh, before the Jewish leaders. And so we see all this, and we say, it's sad, it's improper, it was unjust, but it was in the plan of God. All right, we'll pause there. Any, any comment or question on this appearance before the high priest? Of course, this has had to change much, has it? <laughs> I'll let them, that, 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 that one go, okay? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Woven in between the questioning by the high priest is our main topic of the day. And that is the denial of Peter three times to say, I don't know this man. I wasn't with him. When we think about this, 
this is one of the unexplainable things that we struggle with, right? How could this close, close associate of Jesus that had walked and talked with Jesus for probably three years, that was part of the inner circle, the close three, Peter, James, and John, Jesus, how could we see this man, Peter, disowning his Lord? It doesn't make sense, does it? No. This is one of the things that we would not have included if we were writing a fairy tale about a great man in the past. We would not include all this because our hero would be perfect and everybody that would be around him would be perfect. But one of the evidences of Scripture being inspired is that the good and the bad were all included because that's us. That's life. That's humans. We fail Jesus from time to time. And this is what Peter did in a way that we could never do. All right, let's, let's look a little bit at Peter's denial. Let's turn over to John 18, and we're going to read from John 18, beginning with verse 15. John 18, verse 15, Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Let me pause there. This other disciple is John, the writer of the gospel. When John writes the gospel, sometimes he, he calls himself the other disciple. Sometimes he calls himself the one whom Jesus loved. He didn't identify himself that said, Peter and I went with Jesus. He was not that blunt. He sort of said, the other disciple and Peter went. So that, that's who we're talking about here. This is John, eyewitness, first-hand report. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple was John, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of the man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. And Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. All right, we'll pause there for a moment. The next few verses uh, talk about a, a questioning by Annas, the high priest from, that we covered last week. This is some time elapses here. So we'll skip down to verse 25. Verse 25 of John 18. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, You are one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I'm not. One of the high priest's servants a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. All right, let's turn back to Matthew 26 and we'll read a similar view of this. Matthew 26 beginning with verse 69. 26-69. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you're one of them. 
your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed and Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. We see this situation here with Jesus and Peter. And we think, Jesus, didn't you see this coming? Well, yes, of course. Since we're in Matthew 26, earlier in the chapter, verse 31, this is where Jesus says, all of you are going to forsake me tonight. You're all going to fall away. And then this is when Peter says, no, if everybody falls away, I never will. This is when Jesus says to Peter, point blank to his face, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter says, no, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. I will never deny you. Now, if we knew that our closest friend, our closest buddy, was going to deny us, turn, turn his back on us and stab us in the back, so to speak, within a few hours, we'd be done with him, right? I'm through with you. I don't, I don't need you. Leave me alone. But Peter took, or Jesus took Peter with the other 11 into the garden as if everything was normal. Okay? Now, not only that, instead of shunning Peter, remember Peter, James, and John were asked to go with Jesus a little farther when Jesus fell to the ground and prayed. Jesus still wanted Peter with him. Intimate circle, even to the end. Jesus did not turn his back on Peter, didn't shun him or push him aside or ignore him, but he went with Peter along the way. Okay. That's hard for us to understand, right? That's the kind of man Jesus was to love and be devoted to his people. All right, as this, as this denial starts, we see that that John, the writer of the Gospel of John, had some connections. He knew the high priest and he got Peter in a little bit closer to the action. Peter was curious. Peter was sort of watching, we were, we were told, see the outcome of all of this. So Peter got in through John's vouching for him. You know, he's okay and all that happened. We see the denials. The first one was sort of soft. Well, I know I don't I wasn't with him. The second denial was a little bit stronger. No, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, don't know the man. But the third denial was pretty hardcore. He swears that he never knew the man. Something like, as God is my witness, I don't know the man. Something like that. Or, you know, I swear before God that I do not know this man. And that's serious business. That's deep. That is serious business. And this is what Peter did. It was deliberate. It wasn't a spur of the moment thing. Now, we might think, well, these, these three denials just came right after one another. Bang, bang, bang. Maybe they were gathered around and, and first denial, then the second denial, then the third denial, just, 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 just in one ball of wax. We read in John, the denial happened number one first. Jesus was interviewed some more, questioned about what he was teaching and all that. 
and then the other denials after that. Uh, another account that we have says there's about an hour later between the first and the second and third, an hour. Okay, so this was, this was not just a gut reaction spur of the moment. It was over an hour's time that this <coughs> occurred. So this is serious. And we see poor Peter as he swore that he never knew the man and the rooster crowed. And it says, Peter remembered the words of Jesus and he went out and wept bitterly. He was a broken man. The account in Luke brings up a little item that is important. When this rooster crowed, it says, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. The Lord looked straight at Peter. Peter remembered the word of the Lord before the rooster crows today. He will disown me three times. And he went outside and went bitterly. Can you imagine the look on Jesus' face? as he turned and looked at Peter. I've never seen a painting of that expression. It's too painful. We don't want to see that. We want to see the Last Supper. We want to see Jesus holding a child. We want to see that it is Jesus on the cross, yes, but this, this pained look of why did you do this, Peter? You can tell from a person's face, their eyes, their expression, more than words could ever express how someone feels in that situation. Can you imagine how Jesus felt at this time? You look at Peter. Peter remembered. He broke down and wept bitterly. Now when we think about this, Peter is devastated as anybody would be. Peter just didn't get up and walk out, but he wept bitterly. Yes, Dr. Lee. You know, we sit here wonder what that look was. I bet it was not a look of anger or viciousness, no. but a look of care and concern. And look, 50 days later, one of the greatest sermons in the Bible, Peter delivered. Yes, that's the whole point. Peter was a broken man here. But Jesus remade him into this firebrand preacher of the first century. This man, Peter, 50 days later, stood before thousands in Jerusalem and said, men and brethren, these men are not drunk as you suppose, but it is from the Holy Spirit of God prophesied in the Old Testament that God, God's Spirit will be poured out, out upon us. And he gave this Pentecostal sermon. Verse 36 of Acts chapter 2, men of Israel, I want you to know that this Jesus has now been made both Lord and Messiah. Lord and Christ. This was, this was the same man that just denied him 50 days earlier. We see Peter was remade after he was broken. And that's what we've got to remember here. Now, let's think about some conclusions about this denial a little bit. Um, Peter repented. He didn't turn his back on Jesus forever and walk away. He did repent. Uh, yes, it was deliberate. No. But, but Peter broke down in repentance when his heart was touched. Okay. Now, we asked the question, and it's, it's unanswerable for us. Why and how could Peter do this? And 
the only thought that makes any kind of a smidgen of any sense is you remember in the garden as Jesus was praying the three went to sleep in fact Jesus came back and said why are you sleeping Peter he even pointed Peter out asking that we see Jesus in the garden he gets through praying the third time says come on arise let's go it's done it's over with here comes my betrayer and remember Peter's the one that gets at his sword and tries to cut somebody's head off, cuts off the ear instead. Jesus puts the ear back on and heals it and said, put that sword up, Peter. This is not an earthly war. If I wanted to, I could call down thousands of angels and they could fight for me. Peter, put that thing up. See, Peter was crushed. Peter was devastated. He's thinking, come on, Jesus, I'll fight for you. Come on, let's go. Peter says, no. Uh, Jesus says, no, just put that thing up. And see, Peter was thinking, again, as always, of an earthly kingdom. Earlier in his ministry, there's a little passage in Matthew where Jesus spoke plainly to his twelve to say, look, I'm getting ready to go to Jerusalem. They're going to be uh, captured and put on trial and killed, but I'm going to rise on the third day. And, G and Peter said, no, no, no. Jesus, we're not going to let that happen. That's not going to happen at all. And that's, this is the time when Jesus had to say, no, get behind me, Satan. You're thinking about worldly things, not the plan of God. Peter could not understand a spiritual kingdom. Peter was looking for an earthly kingdom. And so when he was devastated, he might be thinking, is this really the Messiah or not? Have I been mistaken? Have I mis been misled? Have I really missed the whole thing that maybe he's not the Messiah? It could be. That's the only thing uh, that might have gone through Peter's mind. I just thought he was the Messiah. But I'm, I'm, I'm just so devastated that, I, that I, I have to question myself. And so that's the only reason that uh, is ever thought of that might give a small reason for Peter's actions. And we'll never know. Let me pause there just for a moment. Let me give you a drink. <clears throat> Is there any other explanation of this? We can wonder all year long and not come up with it. But the point is this. <clears throat> you see, Peter is always, you know, strong-willed. He's impetuous. He's first to the trigger, ready to go. First to fight in the garden. Yet the first to deny, the first to repent, and now he's a broken man. You see, it could be that it took this devastation of Peter for God to remold it, to reshape it, to rebuild it into the man of Pentecost. See, um, Jesus could have maybe lectured Peter about how he needs to do and how he needs to go and how he needs to reform and how he needs to be strong and how he needs to... And Peter would say, yes, yes, okay. Like we all would. And then we'd walk out and forget him. But when this lightning bolt, as we would call it, of Peter's failure and devastation and then God remaking him into the man of Pentecost. It maybe took this to break Peter down, disassemble him, 
put him back together as God's man. We think, could it, could it take that? Oh, remember the story of Saul of Tarsus? Fire-breathing Jew that was out capturing Christians and taking them to jail and on the road to Damascus, what happened? God struck him down, blinded him for three days, just destroyed him. But yet he rebuilt Paul into the man that went to the Gentiles. You remember Paul's writings said that conversion was such that I wasn't worth that. And he called himself the chiefest of sinners. That was Paul's opinion of himself for his life. Was I was the chiefest of sinners. But God struck me down and rebuilt me. So we say, this is for whatever reasons Peter denied. Well, that's immaterial for us to speculate on. But we've got to see the results on the other side. That Peter was rebuilt into this man that God could use. So our thought for us, <clears throat> these are all facts, but for us, what does this mean for us today? Sometimes we say, well, you know, if God could rebuild Peter, I guess he could re rebuild me because I've done things just as bad as as Peter has. I beg to differ a little bit here. <clears throat> what Peter did is worse than anything we can do. And why do I say that? See, Peter lived with Jesus for about three years. Day and night, ate together, walked together, talked together, talked face to face, back and forth. And we don't do that, literally, with the physical Jesus. Peter was told by Jesus to his face, you will deny me three times tonight before the rooster crows. Jesus did not say that to us personally. And Peter said, no, Lord, even if I have to die for you, I will not disown you. And see, we don't did, do not have that interaction with Jesus personally. So what I'm saying is that Jesus and Peter had a relationship that you know we'll never have, obviously, because Jesus is not alive physically in the, in the body with us today. What Peter did is because of the closeness he had with Jesus is worse than any denial we can do. Do we deny Jesus? Yes, we can, we do. When we sin, yes, we, we know all that. And some of us may have denied Jesus the way we lived or done in ways that we don't ever want to remember or talk about. And God has remade us yet, yes. But let's remember, if Jesus can rebuild who has done something that worse than we could ever do. He can rebuild us for sure. Right? If he can rebuild Peter, remake Peter, he can surely remake us. And the thought is, our hearts need to be soft. They need to be made of clay. As the image goes, the potter remake our hearts into the image of Christ.